So this was not actually the stream that I planned for this evening. I had another stream planned, but it required quite a lot of prep work, which I haven't quite finished. And so I was thinking, what's a good topic I could choose for today? And I thought, well, talking about the biggest plot lines that are left unresolved from the Horus Heresy is pretty interesting. If you're a fan of this channel, you probably noticed I've already talked about quite a few of them. So this will probably be a condensed version of all of those going over those and a bunch of other things that i've yet to talk about on the channel so the first thing to talk about i think is probably going to be perturabo so in this video i wanted to talk about things that i think the siege of terror has directly led into or the siege of terror has contributed towards and so i'm not going to talk about every single character from the setting because all of them will have or a lot of them will have some development but Perturabo, for example, is a good thing, a good example of something that the story is leading into. So in the End and the Death Volume 3, we actually seem to be getting information officially on what is happening with Perturabo in terms of his ascension to demonhood. At the start of the novel, Perturabo is kind of considering going back to the siege. He's like, could I go back? Will Horus forgive me? And he is convinced that Horus is going to come for him and bring absolute retribution. He comes to the conclusion that, well, you know, Horus is going to try and kill me. I need to do something to even the scales. And Perturabo uses this terminology around a perfect weapon. And he wants to forge himself into this perfect weapon. And he's going to kill Horus and all of his sons and everybody that shares the name Lupercal. And that's where the passage kind of finishes up. So it looks like we finally have a reason as to why Perturabo is going to ascend to demonhood. The reason that's quite significant is because it was one of the biggest questions we had around the demon primarchs. People often wondered, why would Perturabo ever ascend to demonhood? When he leaves the siege, he hates Horus. He's kind of a similar point of view to Abaddon, where he thinks that chaos is, you know, just a trap, and Horus is a fool, etc., etc. He's had he witnessed the ascension of Fulgrim. He kind of loathes chaos, but now it seems we have this understanding of why he would do this and how it's going to happen. He's going to try and forge himself into a perfect weapon, which is pretty cool. I can't wait to see what they do with that. Of course, this is going to be connected to the Iron Cage storyline in the Scouring. So this is where. Perturabo and Rogaldorn have their final fight. Rogaldorn basically goes into a trap set by Perturabo. His, his, uh, the, the Imperial Fists are nearly all destroyed. They are saved by Rebute Gilliman. And uh, yeah, you know, Perturabo uses the... Originally it was like 500 dead Imperial Fists. I reckon they'll up that number because that's, that's not a lot of dead Imperial Fists for modern 40k and heresy. He's going to take all of these dead gene seed, dead marines gene seed, sacrifice it to the chaos gods and get his demon head somehow. And that story is going to be fascinating. I have a big theory, which is that I think Perturabo is kind of going to like, fail in his, his mission here. I think he is hoping, I don't think his goal is going to be to ascend to demonhood in like a classic way. I think he's going to try and do something very scientific, do something involving chaos but he he wants to be master of chaos of course he doesn't want to be used as he has been used by his father and by horus but ultimately as we know it kind of backfires and nobody anybody who messes with chaos ends up regretting it essentially yes please do like the video ladies and gentlemen they probably will just ignore that old law and just wreck it so i i do think that's fair the idea that they might ignore a lot of the old law because the law around the Iron Cage, something we spoke, we've spoken about before on the channel, it's pretty old. It's from 5th edition. We are currently in 10th edition and so many things about the Primarchs have changed from that storyline. So in the book that covers the Iron Cage, Rogal Dawn, I'm pretty certain, is dead dead. They had to wreck on him coming back to life after that book. So, so much by that storyline will have changed. It's It's not been repeated since then. Whereas things like the disappearance of Jagatai Khan, they have been, you know, repeated and consolidated, etc. So we still don't really know a lot about Perturabo and Rogaldorn's relationship. Well, not their relationship, but their final confrontation. I'll go, I'll move on to another topic because uh, it's a super chat. Thank you. Uh, from uh, Yujiro uh, Hanuma. Uh, I already have one in mind. Did Ingo Peck escape? Yeah, another topic 
Hang on, I'll try and find the artwork for it. Um, yeah, another topic we've talked about on the channel before, Ingo Peck is still under the Imperial Palace at the end of the Siege of Terror. If you haven't watched my other stream, you can go check it out for more of the storyline. But essentially, he was being controlled by the Witch Acte during the Siege of Terror. And, oh, wrong with that. Uh, and in the uh, book, The End of the Death, Volume 1, in order to temporarily disable Ingo Peck, John Grammaticus basically attaches, uh, attaches a motion-sensitive mine to him that will blow up if he moves. And he says, look, you know, you might be able to get yourself out of this if you move incredibly slowly, but I'm going to come back for you to free you. And John Grammaticus never comes back for Ingo Peck. And so there is the first captain of the Alpha Legion stuck under the Imperial Palace at the end of the Siege of Terror. So where that storyline goes, we don't really know. Um, there are a litter of Alpha Legionnaires throughout the Warhammer 40k novels. So he could be any one of them, in theory, of course, because he has the surgery to make him look like Alpharius. But I think they're probably going to work him into Dan Abnett's main storyline, which is something that we'll talk about today. Maybe he got himself free and he escaped, but it's, yeah, it seems probably the most boring answer from my point of view. I like the idea that the custodians just kind of found him. I mean, likewise, generally, there is this storyline of there are, we don't know how many, but a, a lot of Alpha Legionnaires under the Imperial Palace, basically in stasis, and they can be commanded to do certain things if you know the right code words to give them when they wake up. You can make them be loyal to the Emperor or to Horus or ignore both of them and fight chaos. Again, it's something I go about over in the other stream, but it's... It's a huge pers it's a huge plot point for the future because Games Workshop can, in theory, write this storyline of loads of Alpha Legionnaires have awakened underneath the Imperial Palace. That would be a pretty cool storyline. If you're not familiar, Alf Alpharius's Primark novel covers the story of where the Blood Games were created, where Alpharius literally nearly, you know, he got into a position where he could kill the Emperor and he ends up fighting Constantine Valder. He kills a custodian to get to this point. Anyway, the point being... Alpha Legionnaires loose under the Imperial Palace is typically very, very bad. So the idea that this will lead into something pretty cool, I think, is a bit of an option. I'd imagine that during the scouring, someone would have stumbled upon an Alpha Legionnaire, Legionnaire sitting in storage. Yeah, I love the idea. I love the idea that someone like opens a fridge under the Imperial Palace and there's just like a frozen Alpha Legionnaire. I think that's just superb. Love 40k, I love your channel. I recently subscribed and you bring a level of description and details and passion at just next level. Thanks so much. Uh, also, all praise Horus. That's, that's okay with that. But fair, <laughs> fair enough. But I tell you what, we can talk about Horus. Oh, I actually don't think I have any artwork for Horus. Oh, actually. No. Okay. Well, you know what? We'll talk about him anyway. So that is also an option that I, I guess in these kind of videos, I need to start differentiating between this is a plot line for the setting and this is a end game plot line so horus in warhammer 4 dk is absolutely an open plot line i just assume it's an end game plot line so for example uh, when people say will any of the traitor primarchs ever be redeemed the answer to the question is like yeah probably but in 40 years time <laughs> because Warhammer has a very long lifespan. Of course, they want to make a lot of money from it before they end the setting. and But that option is still there. Of course, there are multiple incidences across Conrad Kurz and the Emperor, Multarian and Gilliman, that where we, we see that there is an option for traitor Primarchs to be redeemed. For it to happen, you know, we'd essentially have to almost end certain factions. So we'd, we'd be getting right towards the end game, I think, there. The return of Horus Lupercal, I think, is definitely an option. It is something that the emperor hints at because he says i wait for you and i forgive you but i can't imagine them doing that anytime soon so the return of horus lupercal is is very much on the cards likewise uh as someone's put in the chat is the hang on i did get a smile off this uh is the dark king storyline so if you're not familiar the dark king storyline is mainly covered in the end of the death volume two and a bit the first one and this is a storyline based around the Emperor's attempted apotheosis, I guess I would call it. So during the End and the Death, Volume 2, where the Emperor realizes he cannot beat Horus using his raw power. And to clarify, he absolutely can't. He gets absolutely trashed by Horus in the fight in the End and the Death, Volume 3. To combat Horus beforehand, he starts to pull all of this power into himself from the warp. He drinks 
really deeply. And as he he as he drinks more power, he actually goes through an apotheosis into a warp god, into a chaos god, and he turns into a big uh, obsidian sphere. And the idea is that when he emerges from the sphere, he will be a god. He will be a chaos god. And when that happens, the warp will rage for millions of years and humanity will be all but destroyed. However, he is convinced not to do this. He's convinced to give up his godhood, give up this power, because if he, even if he kills Horus with this power, humanity is still going to suffer. And so this is not the way to beat him. And so he relinquishes this power and the Dark King storyline is over for now. So the book is very specific in that the, the Dark King has been vanquished for this age and the Dark King will return in another age. That other age is Warhammer 40k, we would assume. And at some point, someone, perhaps the Emperor, it could be someone else, potentially anyone who can drink that much from the warp, could drink all of that power and potentially ascend to becoming this, you know, fifth Chaos God. And if you're not familiar, in in Warhammer Age of Sigma, there, there are five Chaos Gods. They have a fifth one. So the idea that Games Workshop would chuck another Chaos God into there is absolutely on the cards. They, they, they do it for their other setting, which has an almost identical pantheon. What do you think about the reveal of the Terminus Decree being a virus bomb that kills all Primarchs and Space Marines? I thought it would be something cooler, honestly. So it is cooler than that, okay? So I guess, you know, it takes us on to another point. So it is cooler than just a virus bomb that kills all Primarchs and Space Marines because the Terminus Decree can be easily targeted. So you can have the Terminus Decree just kill the traitors and the traitor Primarch. So it won't actually kill all of the loyalists. However, as I'm sure you're aware, the Grey Knights, and specifically Caldor Drago, have not used it because the traitor Primarchs are still around. And the question is, well, there's a couple of questions around it. One, you know, do they have a discussion in the scouring around using it? Because multiple people know what it does and what it should do. Why haven't they used it? Is it because they fear that potentially Basidio Foe lied, its creator? Um, do they think that maybe the virus could mutate and actually attack other people? Do they think it won't work, as you know, Foe has said? So why why haven't they used this device? What was the reasoning behind it? And also, why was it given to the Grey Knights from the Custodes? So at the end of the End in the Death Volume 3, the device is taken into custody by the Custodians, who then give it to the Grey Knights at a certain point. Why would the Custodians do this? The Grey Knights have just been founded at the end of the Horus Heresy. And is there something about the way the device works, which means that only the Grey Knights can properly deploy it, for example? Is there something about the Custodians which meant they couldn't be trusted to have this device? I will say Amon does consider using it in the siege to basically kill all of the traitors and all of the loyalists, which is not a thing he has to do, but he considers doing it anyway, which is just objectively pretty funny to me. There's a lot of questions around this device that still go on. I've done a whole video on its creation. If you haven't checked that out, I would recommend that. Put a lot of time into that video. It was... Um, it was a lot of fun to make. And yeah, the storyline is kind of wild. And uh, another thing to talk about, of course, is just Basilio Foe himself. So at the end of the book, we find out, or it's very much heavily implied, that Basilio Foe has managed to transfer himself into the body or, or a clone of the body of Zaranchek Xanthus, who was one of the chosen of Malkador. And he will go on to become one of the first Inquisitors. And so... Basilio Foe is one of the first Inquisitors who wields tremendous power. He is essentially the, the oldest enemy of the Emperor in existence, and yet supposedly he's a member of the Inquisition. So what is he doing? You know, he's had a, he 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 does die officially, and the records we have say that he dies. I think it's two millennia later, but you know he has a very long time serving the Imperium, or serving the Imperium as the Inquisition. He founds his own type of theology within the inquisition where um xanthites basically they have no problem with using chaos artifacts etc etc so there's yeah this is his storyline is going to be wild cannot wait to see what they do with it and it was officially executed by other inquisitors uh during i think it's the 32nd millennium but he's already escaped death once i, I imagine he can do it again so i can't wait to see where they take foe he's one of the 
most important characters in the setting from my point of view and what they are, yeah it's just absolutely wild he has the capacity the knowledge he takes the notes with him on how to create the terminus decree so will he create another terminus sanction and will he threaten to use it the xanthites themselves go on to develop another type of theology within xanthism which is uh horusianism horusianism i don't know what you call it uh, and basically the idea is that, that some some xanthites believe the best thing to do is to resurrect horus lupercal or create a new horus lupercal who can use the powers of chaos to serve the imperium so yeah there's a lot of wild things they could do with this um yeah i cannot wait till they could do with that is perturabo a demon you think uh, yeah, so actually I did a, a video for members not long ago on the channel and that actually goes through the passage of Demon Purty and so he, he's he's very clearly a demon. We get a, 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 it's a quite a brisk description of him but we do get a description of what he's like as a demon so that is on the channel if you want to check it out. Could we see the old ones returning? I, I do think there's a good chance we'll see the old ones returning in Belisarius Cool storyline or, or a old one maybe or just them running into an old one because... Um, if you're not familiar, one of the Spellisarius school's plans to kind of save the Imperium is basically to uh, travel back in time through using uh, a black hole to a planet that existed during the war in heaven. Because on this planet will be knowledge on how Blackstone works and where can they get more Blackstone, etc., etc. And so th that's definitely an option that um, on that planet is an old one. So I think we might see one of them. You never know. I think it would be pretty cool. The, uh, uh, like a storyline around the last old one in Warhammer 40k would just be very popular. I could see people liking that. They like to bring stuff from like Rogue Trader back into the setting where possible. It's another thing they've done with um, like Dark Mechanicum and the um, Chaos Android. And so the idea that they bring a Slan officially back into this, because Slan were a thing in like Rogue Trader but they're not a thing in 40k really. So bringing an old one back as like the last slam would be really cool, I think. And I think fans would love that. So I could see that happening. Uh, so is Vanis, is, so is Malice, Vashtor, or the Dark King, which is going to be the fifth Chaos God in your current opinion? I don't think they have any desire to touch Malice. I think Malice is, just doesn't really work as a fifth Chaos God because there's nothing... So yeah, and it's, it's same with same with the Dark King. The Dark King would I don't think the Dark King can actually rise to be the fifth Chaos God because it would, it only works if you're like the god of something. And being the god of like ruin, as the Dark King is, or um being a god who devours other Chaos God in like Malice's case, it just doesn't really work. Um but Vashtor would work really well. So Vashtor being like the Chaos God of innovation. Uh, like that kind of that works pretty well i think that's pretty cool um there's a bit of crossover with, with like slanesh but there's always going to be bits of crossover a cypher does anyone know where he is right now or what he's doing i mean that is another one of the unfinished plot lines so if you're not familiar big retcon to the siege of terror or addition i guess you might want to say is the introduction of the dark angels as a faction who fight on the siege of terror the exact numbers of Dark Angels that fight on Terra is inconsistently written. So in one book, it said that uh, 10,000 Dark Angels are at the Siege of Terra. In another book, it says that over half of the Dark Angels are at the Siege of Terra. It was the Dark Angels that were led by Corswain who had received reinforcements from Luther. This is a plot line in Luther's novel that we find out. And so lots of the uh, recruits from Caliban are taken by Corswain and, of course, his forces to terror to fight for the emperor and they have a whole plot line around uh, uh rescuing the astronomicon which had been taken by traitor forces and then getting it relit and in the end with the help or just pretty much solely with the help of uh, euphrates Keela and uh, other uh, faithful of the emperor then they get the astronomicon relit this is a very important point in the book because it allows rebute gilliman to make his way to terror and is also implied that when the Astronomicon gets relit. That gives the Emperor one final kind of power boost to help him kill Horus. So the Dark Angels are absolutely in the um, Siege of Terror throughout from Saturnine. However, the plot line that's kind of building up is the uh, conflict between, of course, the Fallen and the Dark Angels. 
So uh, and the loyalist archangel. So Corswain is kind of the central character of this storyline. So um, the Lord Cipher, who was once a star angel called Zahariel, he has realized that uh, he's a member of the Fallen, and he is uh, he's taken on the mantle of Cipher, and he has he has realized that if they can get Corswain to fall, they can make Corswain betray the Dark Angels. Then a lot of the other Dark Angels will fall underneath the fallen banner because everybody loves Corsway and he's like you know he's the ultimate dark angel everybody adores him even the lion adores him and so the fallen want to bring the, the fallen want to turn Corsway against the lion and that's going to be their big attempt now we know that it's not a very smooth journey from this point out because we do know that Corsway and Zahariel are going to duel when Caliban is destroyed because uh, Luther tells us that they did uh, however, there is still a possibility that potentially in that duel, uh, Corswain is convinced to betray um, the lion. And, and so we have this kind of dichotomy in the setting now of who is Cypher? Is Cypher going to be Zahario or is it going to be Corswain? And whoever it does takes on the mantle of Cypher for the next 10,000 years. So, yeah, we have this whole, we have, the, I think, there, I think we're going to move more and more into this into this plot line of who is who is Cypher. It's one of these two characters. Who is it going to be? And uh, yeah, I'm loving this as a Dark Angels fan. And even just the fall of Caliban itself, we still need to have. And it's probably something that's going to be novelized, I think quite early on into the scouring because of course the lion is back and they probably want to have uh, the 40K storylines unravel and it'd be nice to have the fall of Caliban written by that point. So, yeah, I can't wait to see what happens there. One slight retcon they made to the Dark Angel storyline, I think, was that it's said now in like the later lore, and this never said this in the old lore, that the Lion is going to find out about the Fallen on Terror, and that makes him leave Terror almost immediately and go back to face uh, Luther, at which point he is fired upon. So, can't wait to see that. Um, sorry, that was quite a lot. But yes, this is absolutely uh, yeah one of the, the the big Dark Angel storyline. And I suspect maybe the early storyline from things we talked about today to be resolved. Because, of course, the Dark Angels are now front and center of the setting in 40k. Now that the, the, the line has returned. And I can't wait to see what they do with this. Would the Terminus Decree actually kill Demon Primarchs or just banish them to the warp? So it would. the idea is that it would kill them. It's a great question. So this is one of the things I talk about in the video. So originally, they, originally the Terminus Decree was designed such that it would attack a Startesian flesh. So the flesh of all of the Primarchs and all of the uh, Space Marines. However, that presented a problem because then the souls of all of the Space Marines would survive and the Space Marines and Primarchs who are drenched in the warp, so uh, demon Primarchs, possessed, etc., etc., they would probably be able to kind of avoid a death in this respect or would be able to regenerate. And so during the course of the story, the device had to be refined such that it would attack the parts of the Primarchs and the Space Marines that exist in the warp. Foe accomplishes this, and so officially, according to Foe, by the end of the story, his weapon would work to kill all traitors of all kinds. He also refines the device such that it can be targeted. Another super chat, OMAC. Uh, in the end of the death, volume one and two, Katsuhiro was carrying a baby throughout the scene. <laughs> yeah. Do you think the baby is the star child or the, the shard of the emperor? Uh, I don't think that would be the case, but um, it could be cool. I mean, I don't know if the baby is of any significance, but it could be. They could do something with that. Katsuhiro is, if you're not familiar, is a, a guardsman that appears in many of the heresy books and uh, the siege books. I thought he was going to be the guardsman that stood before the emperor uh, when facing down Horus. That never came to pass because, of course, it was old person. But, yeah, I mean, the idea that he goes on to maybe do more stuff and this baby does too uh, could be could be quite interesting. And, you know, maybe I think I saw a theory he might be like a high lord of terror or something like that, which would be pretty, pretty cool. Uh, I'd like that. Grim Jim, Foe didn't die in the end of the Death Volume 3. So Foe does die. So, if, sorry, if it wasn't clear there. So Foe does die in the end of the Death Volume 3, but in the... He dies with a... a, a it says he dies with a smile of satisfaction on his face. And then in the end of the book, Zaren Chexanthus is having... You know, his inner monologue is he's clearing up everything that's gone on. 
and it says that he destroys the body of the original Zaranchek Xanthus and he takes um, Foe's notes. Now when, uh, sorry, this is quite specific, but when Dan Abner writes Foe in the books, he puts like quotes in brackets, if that makes sense. So uh, like little thoughts he has, he puts in brackets when Foe's like thinking. And when Zaranchek Xanthus has these final thoughts, he has in brackets his thoughts. So it's implying that, that Basilio Foe was able to transfer his mind somehow into a clone of Zaranchi Xanthus, and so Foe is now in this new body. I hope that made sense. <laughs> uh, do check the video if you haven't watched that. I hope the wedding plan is going well. I've seen an Instagram account with your name and your shorts. Is that you just an imposter? Yes, it is. Although this is something, I saw Wes Hammer post about this today. So this is a really weird thing that happened. So there's a, that Instagram is my Instagram. There was a Facebook account that was created under my name and posted all of my content to it and messaged me and has asked me to pay him to take the, the account down. I don't know if this ever works, but uh, yeah, he does. I will, I will post the Facebook account in the comments because like, yeah, screw this guy, man. Like who does that? It's just weird. I don't even know what the point is. You don't really make any money from Facebook or anything, but uh, yeah, I don't know what people do. I think it's just to extort extort youtubers <laughs> for some reason my conspiracy theory is garvio Loken will return as an imperial saint through his loyalty you could even have a trial like celestine as much as i'd love to see it i think his death is pretty solid in the law but i will go on to another plot point which i think is really cool and i'm gonna have a video on this in the future so one of my favorite plot points that's left open at the end of the book is the plot line around Litu. So Litu, if you're not familiar, is a, one of the first Space Marines ever made. And he goes with the Emperor and Keikautus and uh, Gavio Loken to face Horus Lupercal. Litu is the only person that kind of properly survives that and makes it back to Terra. And he looks like this. He's like a, it looks like a Mark VI Space Marine, but he's He's one of the first Space Marines and has some of the oldest armor that you could possibly have and has a bolt gun that was uh, made on Terra, not on Mars. It, you know, he's, he was created before Mars unified with Terra. And Litu has no Primarch. He has uh, two... He has His, his biological gene sires are just the Emperor and Erda. So he's kind, of like, he's kind of like a brother to the Primarchs in that respect. Anyway, so he helps the Emperor fight against Horus. And when he when he um, when he uh, uh, helps the emperor, one of the things that happens towards the end is the emperor has been not the emperor gets knocked out many times in his fight versus Horus. And one of the times, Litu rushes over to the emperor, and uh, King Counter's Dusk distracts Horus, makes his final stand, and Litu shakes the emperor. He's like, "Wake up, wake up! You have to wake up. Uh, your demon son is coming for you." And then Horus finishes off his custodian. And comes over and grabs Litu and picks him up. And he says, he says, who are you? <laughs> why, why are you here? And then he says, you were talking about Erda, weren't you? Erda's your, uh, your mum, my mum. Uh, and she is dead. Erebus has told me that she's dead. And then Horus throws Litu at Corn, And that's not an exaggeration. He literally throws Litu at the blood god. And uh, he smashes into... Uh, a big wall, which is later revealed to be a massive axe. And Litu looks up and he sees, he can feel the presence of the four chaos gods around him. And he looks up and he sees Korn looking down at him. Now, that's where the chapter ends. And in the next time, the next time we see Litu, Litu is back in the throne room, uh, you know, the court, the court of Lupercal, apparently fine. And Litu is the person who goes on to convince Rogel Dawn that they need to put the Emperor onto the Golden Throne. And Litu's storyline ends with him finding or him drawing a card from his tarot deck, because he's a big believer that the tarot deck is very useful, as his mother was, that he, he finds a card called the Revenger. And so I think that Litu is going to be a space marine on a mission to go and kill Erebus. And that's what I think they're going to do with his storyline, which I think we all want to see. I don't think that will be a quick journey. I think that will, ha that will take a long time to happen. But that's what I would, yeah, that's what I would love. 
Either me or is it possible that the Men of Iron will be returning back in the main storyline? It seems there is more and more instances of characters wanting to get possession of that tech. I think with things like the Votan, there's definitely an option for something kind of similar there. Some sort of uh, artificial intelligence revolt. But I don't know if we would have like a dedicated men of iron faction i don't personally I don't think it's likely hit um i'll be honest sorry about that <laughs> but uh they are kind of like the foundation of the setting and the, the instances of the tau having ai and the leagues of votan having ai those are built upon the mythology of the men of iron and i guess even now we still don't have a lot of information on them but a thing that is quite interesting is that we we are going to have the chaos android back in 4zk that's something that was introduced in the book Gene Father. Um, and actually, it's a pretty good segue because another character that's still around at the end of the Siege of Terror that needs to be dealt with is Kelbor Hal. Kelbor Hal was the um, leader of the Mechanicum and later the Dark Mechanicum. Now, Kelbor Hal is still alive at the end of the Heresy and he's waiting for Horus to kind of signal his victories. So he can come and start rebuilding the Imperium. However, uh, um, we assume he dies at some point in the scouring uh, after Horus, of course, is defeated. The reason I bring that up is because in the book Gene Father, they've got this um, chaos android body that it, uh, chaos androids were originally designed to house demons, but they say in the book that their plan is to uh, allow their master to return to them. And I would guess that master is Kelbor Hal. So I think this uh, ancient tech priest and leader of the Dark Mechanicum is going to return to the setting in Warhammer 40k in this kind of chaos android uh, form. So I'm quite excited to see what they do with that because, yeah, more Dark Mechanicum is good. I've been saying it for a while, I think Dark Mechanicum is going to be a big release sometime in the, in the future years. So Nandrek is still alive at the end of the Heresy. We last see him in the end of the Death Volume 1. He has a plot line throughout the Horus Heresy and into the Siege of Terror, and he actually ends up aiding uh, Eldrad Ulthran in his quest to kind of purge the uh, remaining members of the Cabal, and he is released by Eldrad to uh, go on his mission, and his mission is to kill Lorgar. He does rock up at the Siege of Terror, kills a bunch of word bearers, and his, he's a, sorry, I didn't clarify, he's a loyalist word bearer, He's on a mission to go and kill Lorgar. So at some point during the scouring, when he get this plot line, yeah, it's kind of a minor one, but I thought it was kind of a cool thing to throw in there. Something that's still going on in the heresy and in the scouring, and I'd love to see yeah, him come back. And he's a very popular character. Uh, Super Chat, yo, call me Rob. Uh, are Alpha Marines still around or are they gone? The ones under the Imperial Palace, still there. Uh, Ingo Peck is still there. So yeah, hold, uh, hold on to your horses for that one. That's def definitely coming back. Um, Oz Mutant, thank you so much for joining the channel. There's a bunch of extra content on the channel for members, so do do check that out. So, where were we? Uh, next, so this image I put in because of the Inquisition. So I've mentioned, you know, um, Xanthus and the Inqui Inquisition that's going to be formed into the Heresy. This is one of the big plot lines that's going to happen. So Kirill Sinderman is probably the main person who comes to mind. So we actually find out that Kirill Sinderman becomes an Inquisitor called Veritas in the Beast Arises series. And so during the scouring, the Inquisition is going to be properly founded. Now, one of the things I spoke about in the uh, Terminus Decree video, it's like a side point, is that it looks to me like it's actually Rogel Dawn who, uh, in effect, created the Inquisition because he, he allows for the creation of the Order of Interrogation, which used the famous Eye of the Inquisition and is led by Kiro Sinderman, who goes on to be the first Inquisitor. And so I think that's what they're doing with this plotline. I think we're going to see like the, the Inquisition be founded and based upon this um, uh, order that was created by Rogel Dawn. Ah, okay. Next one. This one's fun. So, Ferris Manus as well. One of the things we find out at the end of the volume two is what it's like being dead. We have a conversation between Sanguinius and Ferris Manus. Now, it's quite it's quite uh, horrible, really, to find out how bad it is being dead because when you die, you are devoured by demons, as you can imagine, and even Ferris Manus is attacked. But in the old law of Warhammer 40k, it was actually said that Ferris Manus will go on to appear 
to um the uh, iron the um iron hands on medusa their his home world and he will appear to them and tell them that he will fight for them and return to fight for them in the you know the end times of the setting and so in theory we're going to have that plot line in the scouring in the near future which would be pretty cool i hope we actually do get to see that i thought according to the new law that horus doesn't actually have his soul obliterated it's not really clear it doesn't say well yeah it doesn't necessarily say his soul was obliterated it's not clear i did talk about i did talk about this in the stream um the other month but yeah it's um it doesn't really it def it certainly doesn't say that horus's soul is obliterated but i will actually say because whilst i've got you here <laughs> uh in terms of souls being destroyed we have this kind of retcon to <clears throat> horus's soul because horus's soul is not said to be officially um destroyed or there's no no wording around that in the book but something has happened to sanguinius's soul in uh, the end and the death and we find this out in the third book because in the third book another thing that happens with Leto is he tries to take sanguinius down because sanguinius has been strung up by horus and demons are coming out of the shadows and attacking sanguinius and so when this happens uh Litu goes to defend him from all of these demons however when Litu tries to take sanguinius down Litu notices that sanguinius it says he's not just dead he suffered a fate worse than death and i think this is going to be a nod to the idea of the sanguinal and the black angel storyline that we get in darkness in the blood so if you're not familiar it's implied that there's kind of um two halves of the blood angels you have the golden angel the sanguinal and that has all the nobility of the blood angels and you have the black angel which is the black rage and they're kind of like the two sides of sanguinius's soul there are other parts within the warp that seem to be like have parts of sanguinius in them uh, like the bloody angel and there's there's even like a reflection of sanguinius's death in um or his image in the uh vengeful spirit but ultimately it, i think there might be a storyline around sanguinius's soul being divided into two and i think we might see this in the near future so i i think they're kind of pressing ahead with this storyline because if you're not familiar the the, the blood angels are, are a doomed faction in, in the setting they will always lose it seems to uh, the the black rage they can stave it off for so long mephiston has bought them some time but uh yeah eventually the blood angels will all succumb to the the black rage and um yeah when that happens they will be no more if an old one appeared in the setting that would cause the necrons to unite probably uh which would not be good for everyone i mean one of the things i love about the necrons is that they are so petty and they are constantly squabbling amongst themselves so a single old one i don't even know if that's enough to do it um it might be you, you might be dead on the money but uh yeah they i'd love that side of the necrons that is so embittered will we see a thunder warrior revival after Tarek was able to fix their genes at the end of outcast dead that's a great question um and i guess that is another thing we could talk about here because it's still something that's that survives at the end of the uh that's continuing at the end of the heresy i, I don't i don't know why they never I was very surprised they never included Tarek in um sorry, I should probably explain that. So uh, there there are uh, various Thunder Warriors that survive their uh, purge uh, during the unification wars and early Great Crusade, and some of them survive. However, we find out in Outcast Dead that the Thunder Warriors suffer uh, degeneration on a cellular level and they have to have their organs replaced over time. And uh, this problem again eventually gets fixed by one of the Thunder Warriors who gets the um, uh, progenoid gland, I think. Is it the progenoid gland? One of the, yeah, one of the organs from the Space Marines. And he uses this to kind of stabilize his body. And so we do have a bunch of Thunder Warriors on uh, Terra even that have stabilized uh, bodies. And so I think most of us kind of expected to see them come up in the Siege of Terror somewhere, but they never did. So I wouldn't, I, it wouldn't surprise me to see a short story where we, you know, we get a, a story around Thunder Warriors maybe protecting civilians during the Siege of Terror or their, them being built into a larger storyline. Because the, whilst The Outcast Dead was a pretty unpopular book, I would say, I don't think it's 
often people's most favorite book but that is a very that's objectively a cool plot point and who doesn't want to see thunder warriors come back it would just be kind of cool do you think the emperor uses john's string to move forward with his actions without worrying about making the wrong choice uh i don't think so so i think john's storyline so if you're not familiar john grammaticus the end of the siege of terror he uh he's also left we don't really know exactly where he'll end up but he is uh using this uh, uh magical string to kind of tie knots to always make to call make a causal loop to always ensure that he and john he and old person will be able to find the emperor at the right time so that they will always be able to convince the emperor not to ascend to demonhood or sorry godhood even and so yeah that's john's plot line now whether john is successful in this well we'd assume he is successful however what he does afterwards we don't know so in th in theory john grammaticus is going to return to the setting at some point and yeah i'm excited to see what they do with that so will biggie establish a permanent realm in the walk do you think i mean i've been delaying it for so long into this stream because as i say every stream i try not to make all of them about constantine Baldur, but that is probably the biggest storyline that is left unresolved by the siege by the end of the siege of terror so the number of connections between the end and the death and the inquisitor series is extensive you know even towards the end we have lily and chase pop up a character from um, ravana and beguin we have annuncia come up again and again we have the creation of the city of dust the realm of the king and the ally and of course we have this huge character change in Constantine Valdor. So Valdor's always been kind of against the Primarch project. He, he was vocally against it to the Emperor. But by the end of the novel, he is uh seemingly losing it, starting to doubt himself, and he's incredibly uh short-tempered with people. And uh it looks, and the, this comes after his fight against Abaddon the Despoiler. And he Abaddon grabs the spear that he uses, and he, uh, his yeah when he does that I think it kind of cuts him, and so uh, Abaddon kind of uh, so when when <laughs> when the constant Valdor cuts people with the Apollonian spear, he learns truths from that person, and so when he cuts Abaddon, he ends up learning that Abaddon will go on to become the despoiler, and he ends up seeing the galaxy in massive turmoil. Anyway, after this is a marked change in Constantine Valdor's behavior. And he is going to go on, it seems, to become this uh, enigmatic figure of the setting known as the King in Yellow. And he will reside in this uh, pocket dimension known as the City of Dust, which was a realm created either by or for Horus. It's not entirely clear. So the Horus could rule the galaxy from this area. It will kind of bridge the warp with, with reality, etc. And uh, yeah, from here, Constantine Valdor has been planning massive things and a, yeah, it's connecting to the uh, Beckwin storyline. I'm probably not going to say any more on that purely because I know I talk about him a lot. Um, but yeah, you can check out my, I've done a stream on him not long ago if you want to want to hear more about that. But yeah, it's probably the biggest unresolved storyline. And I will say something I saw recently, I saw Dan Abner in an interview um, I forgot the name of the channel now. I think it's Maria something. I might be wrong about that. Um, she does she does stuff with Arbitary and if you she's done collabs with him. So yeah, I, I can't remember her name. Someone might be able to find it in chat. But anyway, uh, in that interview, Dan Abner has said that he's written a book that is not the Horus Heresy, but is connected to the Horus Heresy, and that's why I called this the stream. It's not over. Because I think that this final book is going to be the secret ending of the Horus Heresy and the Siege of Terror, and everything is, is you know lots of things are going to tie up here. Um, you're know, going back to what we were talking about earlier. Ingo Peck could be in this plotline too, because there is an Alpharius in this novel. We have uh, Lily and Chase, former members of the Inquisition. We have Anuncia. Everything is going kind to of tying into Beckwin Three, and so that book will probably be the most important book that comes out this year. So I very excited for that. And in a way that is, I think is basically the secret ending of the Siege of Terror.
On the topic of the Dark King, I'm curious if what Sanguinius is going through, soul separation into two separate separate entities, is kind of foreshadowing what's going to happen to the Emperor. Well, I mean, we have got this... Uh, I shouldn't have said this yet either. Uh, we have got this whole plot line coming up with the Star Child um, storyline. Again, I think this is... Uh, I think there's a good chance this comes up in Beckwin, but I also think it might come up, just might be resolved in the Dawn of Fire series. So the st when the Emperor goes to face Horus finally and relinquishes his power, he sacrifices all his love, loyalty, and compassion, sends those parts of his soul into the warp, and they will be they will grow in the warp, uh, just as the Chaos Gods grow, and will eventually, uh, it's implied, be reborn in the Star Child. And in current 40k. The word bearers are very concerned with the uh, imminent emergence of the Star Child. And so I think there's a good chance that we see um, the Star Child in the very near future. Uh, sorry, people in the chat, I put Mira. That was it. Oh, sorry. Uh, that was the name of the channel. Uh, she did an interview with Dan Abnett, which is good. Go check that out. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm going to wrap up there. Um, if there is anything else. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that was all I wanted to cover for this live stream. If there is anything else that you think I've missed and you'd want me to cover, please do let me know in the comments. Most of these topics I've actually talked about at quite some length in various videos, and the ones that I haven't, I have stuff uh, for, for the most part coming out on. But let me know, what other plot lines do you think are still kind of open in After the Siege of Terror? Which ones are you most excited to see? And uh, yeah, which ones do you think you're going to see kind of you know, come to the forefront soon. I think some of them won't really be seen until kind of the end of the setting, but a lot of them, I think, are going to go straight into the scouring and, as we've discussed, into 40K, which is pretty cool. Um, but thank you so much for watching, everybody, and I will see you all next time. Um, I'm not going to hang up the live stream now. Every time I do a live stream, I finish the live stream and select press end broadcast, and then that cuts off my goodbye. So I'm going to look and just talk and chat for a little bit. Um, uh, have any Primaris joined the Red Corsairs yet? Uh, not I mean, they do have like Loyalist Space Marines. So like in the Huron Blackhearts, most recent novel, one of the main characters is a, a traitorous blood angel. So in theory, there will, there will be some. And there, there are traitorous Primaris Marines like in the lore, but then, then, yeah, they don't get a lot of focus really. But they will be, I assume. Um, uh, what do you think Valdor would see if he cut himself with his own spear? I mean, that is an option. The book ends, I think, with Valdor like staring at the spear, like doubting himself. So it could be interesting. Um, do the Grey Knights have Thousand Suns gene seed? Is that why they have the Terminus? Uh, well, it's always said that they have the Emperor's Gene Seed. If, if that's technically true, we don't know, but it appears to be true. It is said that the Emperor kind of forged them into a weapon. So it implies that they, they have his Gene Seed of somehow, and it was never something planned by the Emperor. But um, there's a suggestion that maybe the Thousand Sons, uh, sorry, the Grey Knights have Thousand Sons Gene Seed because... Um, the Emperor offers Magnus the Red a new legion in the Siege of Terror series, and Magnus says no. But uh, if, yeah, it's implied, therefore, it, it could be the case that this is a new legion made from Magnus's gene seed, which, so it, it could be the case. Um, but, yeah. Uh, what do does Primaris Marines mean for the Terminus Degree? <sighs> I think there's, there's still a Startesian. If they can, if it can attack Primarchs, it can attack Primaris Marine. Primaris Marine. I don't think they're stopping it. Uh, what is the main plot line I would like to see play out? I mean, the main plot line, from my point of view, is definitely the Star Child storyline. So uh, this is, I think, this plot line in Warhammer 40k, and I think it will dominate the setting for decades. I think it's huge. So if this is from this this brings together the inquisitor series the dawn of fire series and the horus heresy series so it's bringing everything together and the idea is of course that the emperor will be reborn in a child and at this point in 40k it looks like we're 
were pretty imminent, which in practical terms means like within a couple of years. So I think there is a very good chance we will see the Emperor come back to 40k in the near future. And when that happens, uh, the, this child will be in the setting with this incredible ancient power and it will be kind of like a parent to the Primarchs, but also it will be very young. Exactly how it will manifest, we don't really know. But I think it will be huge. I, I think that is what Constantine Valdor is doing. I think Constantine Valdor is trying to find a vessel that is strong enough to hold the emperor's soul that's what i think is happening and i think that there's a very good chance that beta bequin in the book i think she might end up being the star child because if you're not familiar what constantine valdor is doing one of the things he's doing is taking these luminous warp entities known as grails and shoving them into blanks and Th that is basically the plot line of the Star Child taking a luminous warp entity, taking a warp entity, but in this place, this case, it's the Emperor and putting it into a younger body. That is basically what it is. Um, sorry, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm still talking. Uh, do you think Gilliman will call a truce with the Elder Orcs, Tower, and Necrons to fight the Tyranids? Uh, I think, yeah, I think we will see truces in that respect, but they come and go, come and go. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for the, joining the stream. Uh, thank you to everyone who supports the channel. You're absolutely legend. If you did join the channel, check out the extra content, and uh, I'll see you guys. See you